Gabriela Jahyan is an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at Concordia University in Montreal, Canada. She received her PhD in anthropology from McGill University in 2015. Her research interest has absolutely nothing to do with this, except there's a refugee angle to it. Her research interest focuses on issues of race and racism in Israel, particularly in regards to intra-Jewish ethnic relations and the experience of Ethiopian Jews. She is currently investigating, somebody got excited there. <laughs> she is currently investigating the emergence of diaspora humanitarian practices of American Jewish organizations, which worked in Ethiopia during the second half of the 20th century and came to aid Ethiopian Jewish rural communities living in the Horn of Africa. She is also one of the founding members of Haidun, Armenian house or home, a nonprofit organization that has helped bring and integrate refugees from Iraq and Syria to Montreal. And it is in this capacity that she is here today to talk about interculturalism and the integration of Syrian Armenian refugees to Montreal. Please give her a warm welcome. Thank you very much, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Wonderful. So I'd like to, of course, start off with a very big thank you. A uh, very big thank you to Professor Berberian, who uh, organized this talk, and of course to the Armenian <laughs> Studies program as well, and particularly to uh, Dr. Vahen Armine Merouni for uh, the opportunity for me to come down here and uh, speak to you about uh, something that has been uh, a very uh, important work in the Armenian community that we've been uh, able to accomplish and continue to do so. So um, I think some of you might know this guy. He's put Canada on the map in the last couple of years for good reasons. Uh, particularly, he's young. Some may even say that he's hot and sexy. Um, the good news is, is that not only he may be uh, visibly appealing to some, but he also has a big heart when it comes to uh, humanitarian issues. Um, of course, one of the things that he did in 2015 when he was uh, running his electoral campaign was that he promised that if he were to take office in November 2015, that he would bring over 25,000 Syrian refugees by December 31st, 2015. That's a big promise. Uh, so he took office on November 4th, he got voted in, and then uh, by beginning of January, it became clear that the objective would not be fulfilled by December 31st, but nevertheless, by February 2016, so in a little bit less than three, four months, I would say, there were over 25,000 Syrian refugees in Canada, and he had uh, spearheaded this government-based uh, sponsorship program. Well, not sponsorship, but the, re the uh, government uh, refugee program and bringing them over to Canada. So just to give you all a general uh, overview, uh, so in Canada, since Trudeau took office, there has been, uh, we've had over 40,000 Syrian refugees arrive to Canada up until, this is the data for uh, up until February 2017. And of the 40,000, there are over 14,000 that were privately sponsored. And I'm gonna explain what that actually means and, and what that actually implies. In Quebec, particularly, the province in which Haidun works and in which uh, we sponsored and received the Syrian Armenian refugees, we have received about a little bit over 8,000 8, uh, Syrian refugees. And uh, of those 8,000, almost uh, over a quarter of them were actually sponsored, uh, privately sponsored by uh, this Armenian organization uh, called Haidun, as Huri mentioned. And uh, interestingly enough, though, um, Haidun actually started bringing over Syrian Armenians uh, two years. They started the process two years before uh, the government, whether the provincial or the federal government, uh, began to get involved. So uh, in order to understand the arrival of Syrian Armenians to Quebec, it's very important to understand the historical, sociocultural, linguistic, and political context of arrival, so particularly the province of Quebec. So in order to do that, I'm gonna start off with a brief historical overview of Quebec and why it is different from the rest of the Canadian <laughs> provinces. And then I'll move on to looking at some legislative changes that occurred in the 70s concerning immigration in particular, not only in Quebec, but also in Canada, 
Then I'll follow up with an overview uh, of the Armenian community in Canada and the different wa migration waves. And then I'll turn to the last migration, Armenian migration wave, if you will, uh, the Syrian Armenians, and uh, the, particularly talk a little bit about the uh, program that Haidun uh, implemented for uh, learning French. So this is our great nation. A lot of space if uh, anybody wants to come in. You know, we have a lot of uninhabited land because it's quite cold. But the good news is, is that there's a lot of people, so mostly Armenians, have, been settled, have settled in Ontario and in Quebec. So this is essentially uh, Haidun Works out of Montreal. Um, I'm showing this to you just to give you guys a sense of, of how large it is. It's actually the second largest province Quebec is out of the 13 provinces and territories. It is the most, second most populous province as well. And historically, as you all probably know, it was a French colony until uh, the British took over in a, the conquest in 1763. And thus, it came under uh, British rule as of that date. Um, today, Quebec is the only unilingual French-speaking province of all of Canada. And in 2006, they passed a motion in, in the House of Commons whereby they acknowledged, it was a symbolic acknowledgement, that, that Quebec is particularly a nation within a unified Canada. So there is this mark of distinction, there's this mark of differentiation, uh, and this symbolic acknowledgement of this differentiation that actually uh, passed through um, in the House of Commons, and that's actually quite significant. Uh, essentially, what this motion does is that it, uh, it uh, underscores something that uh, the Quebecois have been fighting for a long time, is that to be recognized as distinct compared to the rest of Canada, um, particularly when it comes to special linguistic rights and various constitutional provisions. So I'm going to get into that a little bit. But before I do, it's important to explain the historical background. Why are they making these demands? Why have these been, uh, why do they have these uh, particular legislative uh, and other uh, constitutional powers that not the other provinces don't necessarily have. Well, traditionally, historically, um, since the time of colonization from, uh, or rather since the time that uh, of, the French con of the British conquest, uh, French Canadians were kept quite poor. They were a very, rather poor population. And uh, this is a backdrop into understanding why identity and why language matters in Quebec. And all of this is going to be trickling down to the very unique program that uh, Haidun implemented uh, not too long ago. So, but historically, they were rather a poor population, mostly rural, uh, largely uneducated, um, living in a province uh, where it was run essentially by Anglophone elites. So the business world, uh, the academic world, uh, all the, imp the power holders essentially of Quebec were all English speakers, whereas all, most of the population in Quebec is actually French. Um, so that's one dimension of their lives. The other dimension of their lives was they were very much living under the power of the Catholic Church, and the Catholic Church was responsible for all aspects of life, including education. But in the 1960s, there was, and of course this is not unrelated to the rise of uh, nationalism and independence movements elsewhere in the world, and the same, uh, the same wave also uh, arrived to Quebec, if you will, uh, in what's known as the Quiet Revolution that occurred in the 1960s. Essentially, the Quiet Revolution was a time of mass economic and social developments, large-scale socio-cultural change. Essentially, what happened was the beginning of the secularized of society. So before, everything was controlled and run by the Catholic Church, whereas now, slowly, we see a movement towards secularization. And we also see the decision, the people made a decision that they want the creation of a welfare state, meaning they believe that the state is responsible for education and that the state is responsible for health uh, care as well. And during this time, we have the development of the divi of divisions, political lines that were formed between f uh, Quebecois who were federalists and those who were, who were sovereignists, so who were working towards uh, uh, becoming independent from Canada. So we have this project of political independence that's starting to foment during this decade. 
And during that time, during the Quiet Revolution, and it's called Quiet Revolution for the simple reason that uh, everybody didn't take arms, there wasn't mass bloodshed, of course, we know of some terrorist attacks that happened in the 1960s, but by and large, it was quiet and that it didn't, uh, it wasn't a mass upheaval, even though there was a lot of changes that occurred, major changes actually. And four of the major changes that occurred um, that are important concerning uh, the arrival of Syrian Armenians and the different kinds of projects we have is, first of all, Quebecois nationalism, which is, I just talked about it a little bit, and then there was a major reform of the education system and Quebec also was granted the right to select its own immigrants for entry to Quebec. And then it was around this time that we see the development of uh, French language rights. So I'm going to go into these very briefly. So the emergence of Quebecois nationalism. Um, the Quebecois people aren't there just to create issues. I remember I was teaching a class at McGill a few years ago and I had a student from, uh, I'm not sure where, which province, uh, in Canada and we're talking, and it was around the time where we, uh, where we, in Quebec you celebrate, um, it's called Saint-Jean-Baptiste, you celebrate, uh, it's kind of like, it's not Canada Day, but it's like the Quebecois version of, uh, of, of celebrating uh, Quebec nationality. And um, he lifted up his hand and said, yeah, but miss, why is it that Quebecois, why are they always a problem child of Canada? Well, there's actually a history to that. It's not like they woke up one day and said, oh, let's just be a thorn in their backs. It all starts with the, the emergence of the Quebecois nationalism starts, nationalism starts with um, the, this consciousness that began developing and really concretized and materialized in the 1960s that we are not the leaders of our own homes. We are not the, the people who have the power to uh, positively impact and to make changes. We essentially are not authorities, don't have author any authority uh, or any power in that sense. Um, and one of the very important, and this is very telling, so the title in, Engl in French is Negre Blanc d'Amérique, but in 1968 there was a very significant document, and I'm not going to read out the English version, but I wanted you guys to see it anyway, just so you understand, uh, get a sense of how deeply uh, uh, oppressed this population uh, was and felt. Um, and so this author, who was the leader of what's known as the Quebec Liberation Front, which was essentially a separatist and Marxist paramilitarist group, wrote uh, a book explaining why the Quebecois, at that time they were called French Canadians, were les Negres Blancs, so the white Negroes of America. And essentially it talks about the uh, long history of exploitation of French Canadians under British North America, and it talks extensively about the colonized position of French Canadians, and essentially it was the blueprint uh, for, Quebecois, for the Quebecois nationalist movement as well. So what happened during this time of the rise of Quebecois nationalism is that there were many shifts. So they went from being French Canadian to taking on the label Quebecois. Uh, during the 1960s, there were some uh, terrorist violent acts that were um, perpetrated by the uh, FLQ, so um, by the separatist and Marxist uh, Quebec Liberation Front. Uh, that ended in 1970 when the group disbanded and then slowly, that uh, interest of independence began, began to shift towards a political, um, a political uh, mission as opposed to um, just you know, the acts of violence uh, and terrorists, terrorist acts that were uh, unfolding in the uh, 1960s. So it's in this context that the Parti Québécois came to power, which is a sovereignist uh, party, if you will. And the whole idea of why this kind of nationalism took hold at that time and the rise of the Parti Québécois was once again the realization that they were not quote unquote masters of or in their own homes. In French we say maître chez nous and on top it says maintenant ou jamais. So it's either now or never essentially to take back control of their own homes. So that's, that's very telling. Um, other, dimen other area where there were major, major uh, reforms was in education. So previously, uh, the Roman Catholic Church uh, controlled all aspects of education up until the 1960s when the Ministry of Education was established. And essentially what the Ministry of Education began to do was uh, the declericalization of the education system, essentially um, replacing uh, you know, the teachers, for example, nuns and priests with, uh, with, with actual teachers. And this, 
of course, goes in line with the secularized, secularization of state and society. So just to give you guys an idea, the, um, the, the education system run under the Roman Catholic Church, there were actually over 1,500 school boards, each with their own systems for uh, equivalencies and diplomas and credits and so on and so forth. So with the Ministry of Education, all of that became centralized. And for example, in Montreal, historically, there were two uh, school boards. There was a Protestant school board and there was a Catholic school board. And after the Ministry of Education came to power, you know, and, the, and once again, in the framework of secularization, they, didn't, they turned the religious aspect towards a linguistic aspect. So it became the English school board and the French uh, school board. And that's actually uh, exists to this day. Another very important uh, aspect of that period was that Quebec got to select its own immigrants, and that they've been doing since about the 1960s. So uh, compared to the rest of Canada, they actually chose uh, who they would allow in, and also they were responsible, unlike the other provinces which, uh, for whom it was uh, federal uh, responsibility, Quebec was uh, responsible for welcoming, what's known as welcoming and in, in integration services. And one of the services, integration services, that they came up with was uh, courses for learning French for immigrants. So French language acquisition of immigrants became an important project in the uh, integration serv services that they began to offer. We also see around this time a very, very important uh, movement to protect the French language, uh, various uh, acts and bills to, protect, to officially and legislatively protect French language rights were implemented at this time. Particularly, a big, uh, a big change came in 1969 when Canada officially recognized both French and English as official languages of Canada. And then later on in 1977, so just a year after the Parti Québécois took power, um, they essentially drew up the Charter of the French Language, uh, which is also known as Bill 101. And what this did, and this is in line with the idea of taking back control of their own homes, um, French became the language of business in Quebec, whereas before everything was in English. There was a restriction of English on public signs, so public signs had to be in French, and that's true to this day. Um, there's a, a law whereby the English text has to be so many times smaller than the English text, than the French text, I'm sorry. Um, another a law that they implemented was that the elementary and high school students could only study in English if their parents did so. So what this did is that if you were an immigrant family and you arrived to Quebec, obviously your parents hadn't studied there. And so because your parents hadn't studied in any English or French, you were automatically, uh, you had to go to French school. And this was one of the uh, strategies that they implemented to make sure that new arrivals learned French and, uh, and were able to function in French in Quebec. Um, one of, so this was part of the sustainability of French language, which is essentially the cornerstone of Quebecois identity uh, and, and of its political project. And one has to remember also that the Quebecois are a minority. Uh, so Armenians, for example, and other ethnic groups in Quebec are a minority, uh, are, a min are minorities within a minority context, right? So Quebecois uh, are very, very uh, cognizant of the fact that they are in a minority situation. Uh, in all of North America, not just in Canada, but pretty much all of the Americas, period, I would say, actually. So for them, language is more than just about identity. It's more than just a political uh, platform. Uh, it's more th than just about creating and, 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 uh, and uh, feeding social debates. It's actually about survival. So um, during the time that Quebec was also uh, able to, uh, began uh, selecting its immigrants. Um, there was a lot of changes that were starting to take shape in, uh, in Canadian uh, immigration law in general. And one of the important changes that occurred happened in 1976, whereby the category refugee became, for the first time, distinct from that of an immigrant. Uh, refugee, and they took up here the uh, definition, uh, they adopted the definition provided by the UNHCR, essentially people forced to leave their country because of war, violence, or persecution based on race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or membership in a particular social group. And with this differentiation, between both categories of refugee and immigrant, we slowly see the basic mechanism of what's known as the private sponsorship program come to fruition. So essentially individuals involved in the resettlement of refugees. I'll explain a little bit later on what that actually means. 
Well, the good news is that this legislation came right on time because a couple of, just a few years later, there was a major humanitarian crisis worldwide, um, which was which essentially saw the mass exodus of people from Southeast Asia, particularly Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam, uh, what was known as the boat people. And as the world saw these horrific pictures of uh, these individuals from that part of the world fleeing in these dingy, very dangerous boats, ring any bells? Um, there were actually two Jewish scholars in Toronto who took up the call and who wrote to the Ministry of Educa uh, excuse me, Immigration and essentially said, look, during the Jewish Holocaust, during the Shoah, Canada turned boats away. Now we have a chance to do something different and act differently. So that got a whole movement, a whole uh, social mobilization began uh, revolving around the idea of coming to aid uh, to the aid of the boat people. And what happened is that the private sector got involved. In other words, private communities, ethnic groups, just regular families and other benevolent associations. And what Canada did in response to the boat, the crisis of the boat people, is that they actually resettled 60,000 refugees in about two years, in 1979 and 1980. I mean, that's actually quite amazing. But what's even more amazing is that more than half of these refugees were not brought over by the government. They were actually privately sponsored by various private sector groups in Canada. So that involved, particularly in the case of the crisis concerning the boat people, over 7,000 different associations, community centers, churches, uh, you know, regular people who got together and who basically uh, privately sponsored the arrival of people from halfway across the world that they essentially shared nothing with, knew nothing about, except for the fact that they needed help and assistance. So what is a private refugee sponsorship? So in Canada, this program uh, essentially is the legislative arm of, what I, of, of a collective expression of solidarity. What that means is that the Canadian government gave the option to its citizens and its the various um, uh, private sector organizations that I mentioned earlier to basically come together and to uh, sponsor a refugee to Canada uh, and be res and have that uh, the the uh, sh the sponsors be responsible for um, integrating so for receiving and for helping with the integration of that family or those individuals. So essentially, the sponsors um, uh, go get into ha have a contract essentially with the government where they sign a sponsorship agreement holder um, essentially between the, the Canadian government and the different residents and nonprofit organizations in Canada. And now, what's really interesting about this project project is that it's, it's, uh, it, it, is, it is quite advantage, advantageous for the Canadian government because it does not rely on public funds um, or resources. So it doesn't tap into anything in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of the resources that individuals might need to um, sponsor these refugees. So instead of relying on the government, it actually relies on mobilization of people who are ready to help, so it relies on various communities and the various families who have decided to sponsor refugees. And the private sponsorship, uh, refugee sponsorship program essentially complements the government-assisted refugee program. So we have these two parallel systems for bringing people over uh, who, have, uh, who have been accepted as refugees, or categorized as refugees, I should say. So how does a private sponsorship program work? Essentially, so from the time of arrival of the refugee family, the sponsors are responsible uh, for the first 12 months of the refugee's time in Canada, responsible for cost of food, making sure that the refugees have uh, food and housing uh, and other day-to-day -day living expenses covered to make sure that clothing is provided, furniture and other household goods. Of course, whenever needed, they uh, help them access local interpreters. In many instances, they need, uh, the refugees need documents translated, so they'll put them in touch with translators. Uh, how to, for those of you, uh, not for this, uh, those of you, but for those who come to Canada as refugees with an education, then there's the whole process of uh, receiving an equivalency of that foreign diploma so that it's recognized in the Canadian context. Uh, it also involves selecting a family physician and dentist if necessary, uh, regular bureaucratic processes, for example, applying for provincial health care coverage, enrolling the kids in school. In the case of Quebec, it would, and, and actually this is also true in, in uh, the rest of Canada too, they also have, um, uh, you know, they have various uh, training language programs for, uh, language training programs for adults as well. 
And then, of course, in general, just providing orientation. How do you open up a bank account? Uh, where do you buy toilet paper? Um, how do you move around the city? How does the bus system work? So these really basic things. And of course, the sponsors are also responsible for helping the uh, refugees look for work. So similar to Canada's sponsorship program, Quebec has its own. Uh, it's a separate system, but it, it, even though it runs parallel to the federal program, it is nevertheless a separate system. And this actually turned out to be a very, very good thing for Haidun and for the Syrian Armenians, and I'll be explaining why. So in particular, uh, Quebec decides on its own quota of how many people to, um, to, to, uh, to bring over. And the provincial government of Quebec, as opposed to the federal government, uh, is responsible for welcoming and integrating refugees. And essentially, it is this th is through the channel of Quebec's collective sponsorship program that Haidun began sponsoring Iraqi and Syrian refugees. And it's because, once again, of uh, the fact that Haidun was functioning out of Montreal and Quebec and had uh, was able to kind of get a head start, if you will, compared to the other associations and even compared to the both provincial Quebecois government and also the uh, Canadian government as well. So what's the community to which these Syrian Armenians came to? Well, I'd like to give just a very brief overview of Armenian migration to Canada. So the first wave, essentially, up until about 1912, saw just a handful of Armenians come to Canada. Armenians who had fled the Ottoman Empire, had arrived to the US, and then who came to uh, Ontario via the US. And then in the second wave, once again, it's a relatively small group. We have about 2,000 Armenian refugees from the Middle East, Greece, and Turkey. But then what happened in the 1930s was that uh, Armenians uh, became categorized as uh, an Asiatic race. And it seems that that was part of the undesired races list. So essentially, immigration was banned for Armenians uh, up until, so until 1950, 1951. And even then, we just see uh, just a little bit over 100 Armenians enter uh, Canada on humanitarian grounds. Is that better? Yeah. No. So. In the third wave, that's when we see uh, diaspora humanitarian activities um, from Armenian, uh, previous Armenian uh, migrants to Canada. So in the, from 1946 to 1960s, we see a very big swelling of the numbers. So we're up to uh, 6,000 more individuals who uh, enter Canada, mostly from Egypt, by and large. Um, settled also in Ontario and in Quebec. So generally, the Armenian community of Canada, well, the two main uh, cities or areas where they've settled is in Ontario and in Quebec. And then in 1948, uh, the Canadian government decided that the Armenians are no longer part of the Asiatic race, but rather they're part of the Indo-European race and therefore somehow desirable. And so at that time, we see the arrival of 500 Armenian refugees from Europe. And then um, slowly in the 1950s, we see private sponsorship uh, operating already very, very s in small numbers. So there were about 550 Armenians who were brought up, uh, who were brought into Canada, sponsored by previous Armenian uh, immigrants. And then specifically in the late 1950s, early 1960s, uh, the Canadian Armenian Congress, which no longer exists, was granted special sponsorship power by the, the by the Department of Immigration. The fourth wave reflects very much what happened in Lebanon and the Lebanese Civil War. So we have in the 1960s and the 1970s arrival of many, many other Armenians, mostly from Lebanon. So today, uh, we know that the main structure and the main formation of uh, the community, Armenian community life, uh, it happened in the 1960s and the 1970s. That's when a lot of the schools were founded. That's when a lot of the uh, centers were built. So currently in Montreal, there are about 30,000 uh, Armenians, Canadian Armenians. In Canada, I've, I was not able to get a very exact um, figure, as you can see. So I found 50,000, 60,000, and then according to the Embassy of Armenia, it is um, in Canada, it's 100,000. So I'm not really sure where it is, but it should give you an idea. I would suspect it's about 60,000 um, in, in, uh, in, in all of Canada. But don't quote me on it. I have yet to find exact figures. Um, generally, it is a community in, the community in Montreal that's segmented. It is segmented along political, ideological lines. In particular, um, there are three Armenian schools. And it's important to note that when I'm talking about Armenian schools in Quebec, the, first la the language of instruction is, first of all, French. 
and then English, and then third, Armenian. So even though there are, there are schools where children can learn Armenian, the language of instruction nevertheless remains French and English, which is in line with uh, what the Ministry of Education requires of any school in Quebec. Uh, we have multiple churches. We have Catholic Church, Apostolic, Protestant, uh, multiple other ones that I haven't named here. And as I mentioned, there are many community centers that, uh, belong, that are affiliated with one of the political uh, organizations um, or another. So in 2006, um, there was the founding of an organization, as Huri mentioned, Haidun, meaning Armenian home or Armenian house. And in many ways, uh, Haidun continues this tradition of diaspora humanitarianism. Uh, that wasn't the initial objective of Haidun. Uh, when the, the organization started out, well, first of all, it was founded in 2006. It's actually a non-political, non-religious, and not-for-profit organization. And the idea behind this organization was to offer social services to uh, members of the Armenian community that would complement what is already offered by the public services uh, of the government. For example, whether it's elderly care, uh, if there's cases of drug abuse or conjugal violence or uh, accompaniment to doctor's appointments, so a variety of service. But the idea here wasn't to duplicate what was already being done by the government, uh, by the provincial government, but rather to complement those services. And one of the, I would say, the ideological basis of, basis of, uh, of Haidun is this idea of inter interculturalism, meaning that uh, one of the recipes, if you will, um, or one of the ingredients of success, I would say, is working and collaborating and creating bridges um, not just with various Armenian organizations, but actually with different non-Armenian organizations, so other civil society uh, you know, types of organization. And interculturalism, essentially, Haidun works, even though it works towards uh, creating bridges with non-Armenian organizations, its central tenet, its, centr its, its main understanding is that Haidun functions in Quebec, and that implies recognizing the French fact in Quebec, and as such implies uh, uh, making sure that Quebecois identity and uh, and the survival of the French language is uh, is 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 actually protected in the various uh, um, in the various programs and in the various types of work that Haidun does. So uh, very much, uh, and I have continuing diaspora humanitarianism. I put diaspora in quotation marks, and I'll explain why. Um, diaspora Armenian Quebecois. So the identity of Haidun as a Armenian organization is very much as a Quebecois Armenian organization. So the objective to help members of the Armenian community and other uh, Quebecois people at large isn't f only exclusively for the benefit of the Armenian community, but the mindset with which Haidun works is that the services offered to Armenian community members is something that will benefit society at large, so the Quebecois Canadian society at large, and not just uh, within the Armenian community. Um, as I mentioned before, Haidun has worked and continues to work extensively extensively in collaboration with tr the traditional Armenian community channels, but unlike most other of the organizations um, in the Armenian community, uh, its success can definitely be attributed, or rather I should say its different way of working, and the success that came from that can be attributed from, uh, can be attributed to, excuse me, working outside of these channels as well. So for example, for the first 10 years, uh, the president of Haidun, uh, Naidi Tavelyan, uh, well she, she was a president, as I mentioned, for the first 10 years, she was actually, an, uh, she is still today an expert in community services at large, not just, not only concerning Armenians, but just in Montreal and Quebec, in Quebec society as well. And there were a lot of partnerships that were created with uh, non-Armenian organizations. Uh, also a lot of links made between Haidun and the municipal government, the provincial government, and also the federal government as well. So we started off as uh, being uh, providing various social services. And then next thing we know, uh, there's a whole um, uh, humanitarian crisis erupted in Iraq, started with the Iraqi sponsorship program. So in 2008, just a couple of years after uh, Haidun was established, um, we would get, well, we, everybody was following the news, everything that was happening in Iraq, and so we began the Iraqi sponsorship program. Um, it takes about a year, so applications were made in, starting from 2008, and about a year later, we received our first family in total, um, there were 48 families that were privately sponsored by Haidun, which uh, translates to about a little bit over uh, 210 people. 
what did we provide as services? So in that sense, it's very much true uh, to the welcome and integration services offered by the province of Quebec. But this is, like I said, these are services offered by a private organization, in this case, Haidun, so it did not rely on public funds. In fact, the whole organization runs um, very much so on volunteers, especially at this time. So one of the, what, some of the services that were offered for the Iraqi refugees was welcome at the airport. Uh, we would actually find housing for the uh, families. Uh, one of the things, uh, well, a lot of people, a lot of people called who wanted to donate furniture and all kinds of things. So when the families actually moved into their apartments, and well, they were apartments, not in individual homes, but in their apartments, they were actually furnished with uh, donations uh, from from all different kinds of people. Uh, we helped the, register their children to school, enroll the parents to French class, help them apply for various uh, government type paperwork like uh, permanent residence status, health care, so on and so forth. Help the parents. Uh, uh, look for employment. But one of the important things that I think um, was very important to the, the uh, people involved in the Iraqi sponsorship program was not just to bring people over and say, okay, now you have your health care card, now you have a job, now your kids are in school, goodbye. There was actually a, an effort made to look at what happens after the arrival, uh, not just the immediate integration services, but a little bit on the longer term, if you will. And it's in the context of this um, of uh, this objective to kind of follow up with the families a little bit more than just the immediate arrival that uh, we designed um, the, a, a specific class, a, a rather program to complement uh, the French learning courses that adults had to take, which are known as cours de francisation, so essentially immigrants, uh, adults who have to go to French classes to learn French, and they're actually free, they're offered by the Quebec government, and the, uh, these individuals actually get paid to go to class. And this is, once again, this is in line with the changes that, were, uh, that had happened in Quebecois society uh, in the last 30, 40 years. And the mission, of course, is once again to, to uh, protect and promote, but also to transmit French language among newcomers. So French, in many ways, is the door to entry uh, to Quebecois society. For the children, however, um, they were they were already enrolled in school, and in school they have what's known as les classes d'accueil, in other words, uh, welcoming classes. And in these classes, they, they basically have the kids who, had, who have just arrived form a, a, a different class, and they, they learn French, so they teach them French. So the kids, the Iraqi children, were already learning French in a school setting, in a classroom setting. But uh, one of the things that Haidun um, designed was actually a free French tutoring program for Iraqi children. Children, and uh, the idea being that the children, once again, this is part of the post-arrival services, if you will, um, being that uh, you know we kind of uh, accompany the children as they kind of became used to the school and used to the changes, and g help them get used to learning this language that is so different from Arabic, so different from Armenian. So, it, it, as a kind of, it was a program that was devised as part of Haidun's long-term education and integration services. And the idea behind that is that um, essentially we, we paired up local French-speaking. Armenian volunteers with newly arrived Iraqi Armenian families, essentially working with children in elementary and high school. So all in all, uh, there were about 10, 12 volunteers, and each volunteer was assigned uh, a child or a family. And in order to make things easier for the parents, the volunteers actually went to the family's homes. Uh, however, it didn't take long to see that these volunteers were not only there to uh, help their kids with their homework or uh, you know, answer whatever questions they might have about French, but in, in many aspects, they kind of became informal uh, integration agents and social uh, service agents. You know, Can you please look at this letter? Can you help me translate this? Oh, I need to fill out this form. Um, what do I do? How do I do this? So th that got us thinking on how would we um, how, were, how would we to design this project a second time around? So um, in 2013, things started deteriorating in the Middle East yet again, particularly in Syria. Haidun would be receiving phone calls because at this point it was, you know, the Iraqi sponsorship program was, was known. Uh, so Haidun would receive phone calls from all over the world of uh, families uh, in Montreal, outside of Montreal, who had families in Syria saying, we need to get these people out, what can we do? So the situation was very quickly deteriorating in Syria. 
and uh, Haidun essentially mobilized the Armenian community to find sponsors with whom they could work. So families that would work with Haidun to sponsor families uh, who were originally from Syria, but who were considered refugees. So in other words, who, were, who had already fled Syria and were outside of Syria. So more than a year before uh, Trudeau and the rest of the federal and provincial governments got involved, in 2013, Haidun started working very quietly um, on uh, starting to do the applications for the private sponsorship program, uh, working with the uh, Armenian Apostolic Church in Montreal, the diocese uh, who served as a guarantor because we were uh, filling out many, many applications and there's a certain amount of money that has to be secured to be uh, a guarantor. So we worked very closely with, with uh, the diocese in Canada and essentially began filing thousands and thousands of applications, all of this volunteer-based, volunteers who selflessly, selflessly spent uh, numerous hours uh, working late and during the day and really all around. Um, and then finally, uh, a year after we began the applications, we received uh, the first family in September uh, 2014, and there have been weekly arrivals since that date, at times multiple families in the same week, uh, but it is still continuing. Um, so far, we have been able to sponsor over 2,000 refugees, uh, Syrian-Armenian refugees, but unfortunately, as of January uh, 2017, the provincial, not the provincial, but rather the government's period um, uh, are not accepting any more applications because there's a major, major backlog um, to this whole process. So even though we have you know, piles of applications waiting to be sent or that were already sent, they are not accepting any more as of uh, for now. So once again, now we have a much larger group of people, of refugees that were sponsored. We're not only talking about 48 families, we're not talking about uh, 200 people, we're talking about 2,000 people, and you know, this number keeps on growing on a weekly basis. So uh, we came up with uh, what's known in French as the Programme de soutien aux apprentissages en français. Essentially, translated in English, would be a program for supporting French acquisition. And I'll explain why is it not direct, it's not directly a French learning program. The idea here is that, so we know, you know, parents are off to their French classes, the kids are in their French classes at school. So they are learning the basics of the French language in a classroom setting. But that's not necessarily the most fun way to learn a language. And we're thinking, how can we make this the platform? The, how can we transmit the importance that, uh, that we know that is the learning French in order to be able to not only function in Quebec, but also to feel like you belong as, as being a member of Quebecois society? How can we help that, that integration in that respect and at the same time have them learn French and actually enjoy learning French? So we came up with the essentially uh, the, the French tutoring program that we kind of re redesigned, if you will. Um, once again, this program is a hundred percent volunteer run program, and basically it provided language learning uh, support to Syrian Armenian refugee kids from the age of five to about sixteen. And the idea was that learning uh, learning French not just to have another. Uh, language in their repert in their linguistic repertoire, but learning language as an integration tool. So, and also one of the ways in which we wanted to turn that into an integration tool was that uh, one of the ways that we came up that would uh, allow us to do that is that the the platform. Uh, on which this French uh, support was actually being given given to these children were social were, was on the platform of uh, social interactions with locals. So we were very very lucky because uh, once again through the connections of the past president who has worked with uh, all different kinds of people outside of the Armenian community related to questions of community relationships and so on and so forth. Uh, we had a, a person and in the Ministry of Education who was actually a specialist in teaching French to immigrants work with us and volunteer and come up with uh, with a educational program uh, to cater for the to the kids. So in 2015 we put out a call for volunteers in November via Facebook and in two weeks the amount of emails that we received was absolutely overwhelming. I'm talking about over a hundred emails and this is only advertised via Facebook. I hadn't you know we hadn't sent emails, nothing else was done at that point. Put it out on Facebook. We just got inundated with emails of people willing and ready to help mobilize to see, to, to see how they can come and kind of ease the arrival and the integration and the transition of these uh, Syrian children. So a few months later, after information sessions and training sessions, we began our first day of program. Excuse me. <coughs> 
in March 2016. So what's the idea behind this program? Essentially, we kept the idea of pairing up Syrian Armenian children with uh, somebody who would help them in, their, uh, in the process of learning French, but by and large, uh, they ended up, the volunteers ended up being just, you know, people from the, the local um, community at large, not necessarily the Armenian community. So each child was paired up with a local French-speaking volunteer. And the educational program of supporting the learning of French was actually done through games and social interactions and various fun activities. And it was very much a more socially intimate way of learning French as opposed to coming to a classroom and just sitting down and learning or trying to pay attention. Uh, so this was based on social interaction, one-on-one -on -one social interaction. And uh, the idea behind this was that by getting to know a local person uh, to develop a love, not just to learn French, but also to develop an interest and a love for learning French. And at the same time, to get to know the local Quebecois, some of the local Quebecois people who volunteered. Um, so for, uh, as I mentioned, in terms of the volunteers, there was a very, very large interest to, um, to help in some capacity or to participate in some kind of project that came to the aid or that uh, facilitated or that at least eased the integration and arrival of Syrians in general. Uh, one of the things that we did is that we kind of set up, a, we had a profile, an education profile done of the children and also kind of a profile done of the volunteers to see if we could match the interests. Um, and of course, the, the, so once again, this whole program was run by volunteers and the volunteers who were, who were helping the children learn French were also, uh, we, made, we had, you know, made sure that they also had continuous support as well. So all in all, during this program, there were about uh, over 100 individuals involved. So we had about 50 volunteers and we had about 60 children. Um, the numbers fluctuated. Um, some of the children came later on in the, uh, literally like arrived to Canada and be started the program later on uh, after it had begun. Um, so that's why the numbers were fluctuating. So essentially in terms of logistics, so we basically called up two colleges, like two very well-known colleges in Montreal and said, look, this is who we are, this is what we're, we, what we're doing. Uh, would you be willing to donate a bunch of classrooms to us for free for four or five months? And we actually uh, had both uh, both colleges gave positive uh, answers, positive responses, and there were two colleges that were located or easily accessible by the Syrian uh, refugees. So we made sure that it wasn't, uh, you know, that they wouldn't necessarily go too much out of their way to bring their children to these colleges. So for four months, these two colleges donated five, six classrooms for free to Haidun, which is really quite amazing. Uh, it was uh, Vanier College and uh, Collège Montmorency. Um, and essentially, in terms of the logistics, well, we had two time slots at both colleges. So both colleges had a session from 9 to 10.30, and then another session from 11 to 12.30, from March to June 2016. So the idea was uh, on a weekly basis for four months, for an hour and a half, each child would spend time with this one volunteer uh, that's how it was designed in practice. It was a little bit more messy. Uh, not every not everybody was always paired up with the same volunteers. There was a lot of switching and people moving around. Uh, but nevertheless, in general, I would say that it was a very positive experience. So who were the volunteers? They were by and large Quebecois of French heritage. Uh, they were by and large people whose mother tongue was French, but not exclusively, of course, because this is Montreal and it's an extremely multi-ethnic uh, city. So we also had many Quebecois. Um, uh, who were of recent immigrant background. I use the word recent because um, really I think of even the French colonizers and the British as immigrants, probably unwanted uh, immigrants to Quebec and to Canada. So uh, yeah, I like to, to you know, remind that they are actually recent, uh, recent uh, immigrant waves. Um, there were very few, there were some, but there were actually very few Armenian Montrealers. Um, there were a couple of families, so some mothers and fathers who would come together and then they'd bring their kids and then their kids would bring uh, some of the toys that they like. So it kind of turned into these family activities for some of the volunteers. And um, a lot of initiative on behalf of the volunteers. Um, one person, for example, came up to see me and said, hey, listen, my father-in-law owns a sugar shack. Uh, how Canadian can you get? And uh, he'd like to come and give a workshop on how maple syrup is made. 
of course, these, you know, when you're a newcomer, you don't know what snow is, you don't know what maple syrup is, you have no idea. So this was actually a really, really nice environment uh, through which these kinds of different uh, various, uh, these different workshops were actually, uh, were held. Um, so essentially, the success of this program and the fact that this program was even able to function at all was based and was really much the result of the mass scale mobilization of both Quebecois society, uh, of Quebecois society and its response to the Syrian refugee crisis. So it was, a, it was, in that sense, a very positive experience. So one of the reasons that we thought of this project as well is, once again, in the mindset of thinking about the integration of Syrian-Armenian families, well, we know that, by and large, most of the Syrian-Armenian families send their children to Armenian schools. So what that means is that re they remain in Armenian-only environments. Um, which is not necessarily a bad thing because it's that community support is quite priceless when you are completely disoriented, you don't speak the local languages, you actually need people to almost translate how to live in this new environment. And I don't mean translate linguistically, I mean just translate in terms of what's acceptable, what's not acceptable, uh, you know, things like, you know, gender equality, which is something that's very, very strong in Quebec, very just basic, uh, basic things uh, of, uh, of how this local society functions. So what the the French language program did was that it allowed these kids to kind of step out of that um, of that Armenian community setting and to encounter and to interact and to interact and to encounter with uh, with the, the, I'd like to think of the kinder and very loving side of uh, both Quebecois and Canadian society of course we also have anti-immigration rhetoric. Um, you know, this is not what the talk is about. But I'm, what I really want to emphasize is that when time came to, uh, uh, to ask for help, uh, we received a lot of support. And it, it was actually quite amazing. One of the idea also was that, so when you're an Armenian child and you, and this is per, based on my personal experience, so it's quite anecdotal, uh, brought up in an Armenian setting, goes to Armenian school for many, many years, uh, you go from one community organization to another, you go to your friend's house and they all happen to be Armenian, um, that transition from leaving that Armenian, uh, that Armenian nest, if you will, in Montreal to actually entering mainstream depending on the person and their characteristics, it, it could be a little bit uh, tricky. So the idea behind this program was also to get a head start in having these kids not only make contact with non-Armenian uh, Quebecois people, but also to uh, start developing the tools necessary to feel a bit more comfortable once they left that Armenian community setting. So the, in terms of the outcome of the program, well, uh, after the program at, in June tw uh, 2016, uh, we actually had parents fill out a questionnaire, we had the volunteers fill out a questionnaire. We were curious to see what worked, what didn't, what do we keep for the next uh, program, what do we need to change? So by and large, the, consens the consensus among parents that it was a very, very positive experience. So uh, it was almost like, okay, but don't you guys have any, anything that we need to improve or work on? They're like, no, 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 it's great. Everything's great. This is fantastic. We're like, okay, that's good. Um, one of the things that, the, another outcome is that the, the Armenians, the Syrians, experienced a, the very, very strong uh, solidarity that uh, was mobilized of the local Quebecois population. And uh, I remember I was talking to uh, a, a father of a young family who had arrived a few months earlier in another setting, not in, this is before the program started. And we were talking, you know, he's asking me full of questions. So we had a really long discussion. And I asked him how the job hunt was going. And he said, no, no, no. Oh, you know, he said, I've heard, you know, people are telling me that the Quebecois here, they only want to hire their own. They don't want to hire other people. I said, okay. I said, okay. I left it at that. I didn't say anything. I said, that's what you've heard. Okay. And then a few months, uh, or actually it was a year later when this program started, he came with his daughter and he uh, registered his daughter. And at that first meeting between volunteers and the families, he saw a room full of like 20, 30 volunteers, non-Armenian, non-Syrian volunteers sitting there. And so we started chatting. He's like, by the way, how much do these people get paid? I said, mm. <laughs> Uh, nothing, they're all volunteers, and his mouth literally just dropped to the floor. Uh, you know, in Quebec and in Canada, we like to talk about, uh, well, not like to talk about, but you know, we, we, we talk about institutional racism and discrimination and marginalization and immigrants and so on and so forth. But one thing that we don't talk about because it is quite uncomfortable is the stereotypical perspective and the negative perspective immigrants themselves 
may at times have towards mainstream, uh, you know, the, the larger society. So it was a two-way street in terms of, of, of kind of um, bringing down walls, or rather at least not, uh, or allowing not those walls to build in the first place, let's put it that way. Um, of course, children developed an increased knowledge of French, uh, and it was very, very fruitful, for, I, I believe, uh, that they learned in a non-academic setting, so there were no tests, they didn't have to sit down. If the kids wanted to go from, you know, one table coloring to another one working with Play-Doh or to the board uh, doing something else, they were able to do that. Um, it was, I, I think that was actually quite beneficial. So it also had a very positive impact on the children, not just in terms of uh, French acquisition, but, all, but also in terms of socialization. I mean, a lot of kids are shy, especially at that age, especially the little kids. And now you have these kids who have come, you know, two, three years uh, since they left Syria, lived in Lebanon, some lived in Armenia. For some, uh, schooling was interrupted for a year or more. Uh, very precarious kind of living conditions and situations. And then they finally arrive and everything is new. Everything is confusing. They're not, you know, their parents are uh, trying to figure out how everything works. You can imagine the confusions, the confusion that the kids may experience. So working one-on-one -on -one with people, uh, essentially what that, it also helped with the socialization aspect. Half of learning a language isn't about learning the grammar, it's about feeling confident enough to try and mess up and feel, okay, yeah, I didn't say it right, but I said it, and that's how I'm gonna learn. And I feel like uh, with this program, because it was one-on-one, -on -one, um, I'd like to think, and I know, I mean, I, I had a lot of volunteers come and speak to me later on of cases where it might have taken three and a half months or like two weeks or one week before the program finished, but the child would slowly start to open up. Some opened up faster than others, uh, some not at all, but then you definitely see this, uh, this the development of, uh, of some kind of self-esteem and socialization skills as well. And I will never forget um, one of the families that we had had a child that was um, disabled. Is that the politically correct term? Yes, thank you. No. Sorry? Physically, physically challenged? challenged? Thank you. I'm an anthropologist, so I'm very conscientious of these things. Um, and uh, nothing major, but he, you know, had a hard time walking, and he came on the first day of the program in March, you know, his head looking down, not making eye contact, very shy, very, uh, very, um, uh, what's it called, in introverted. And we, he ended up being paired with actually a Syrian woman, like a Syrian non-Armenian woman who, who also uh, spoke Arabic, who had been in Canada for 40 years, and they developed this absolutely beautiful friendship. And I will never forget the, the, uh, the uh, pride that I felt uh, on the last day of the program when we gave the kids you know, a little certificate of congratulations, you finished this, this program. And when we said his name, his eyes just lit up head high and he kind of walked towards, got a certificate, nice big handshake, and then he headed back out. And, uh, and he essentially speaks French. I'm not saying he speaks French only because of this program, but there is also another aspect um, that, that uh, this program uh, was able to, another dimension of skills, I believe, that this program was able to develop in some, ch in some children, like in his case. Um, refugees got to meet locals. That's really, really huge, because when you're a newcomer, the only time you get to meet locals or others who are not part of your own ethnic community is when you go to Immigration Canada or if you go to, uh, uh, you know, Health Quebec because you need to fill out forms or you need documents signed. And it's, it's not, it's a, it's a little bit intimidating, you know, to always have to deal with these kind of, um, the, the interface of the Canadian government or with the interface of the Quebecois government. So it, it was a chance for the refugees to meet uh, locals, non-Armenian locals outside of that context where there wasn't a power imbalance. So that was actually quite interesting. And for the locals themselves also, this is at a time in 2015, 2016, when there was a media frenzy, right? The hot topic was the Syrian refugees, and at this point, Trudeau had uh, come to power. Uh, there were all kinds of media attention on him as he welcomed Syrian refugees in the airports. And um, so uh, for, for many local Canadians, all that they knew or saw about Syrian refugees was what they saw on their screen. So this kind of gave them an opportunity to actually meet these people and get a sense of what their journey might have been like outside of the context of the media. And so connecting really with just real and local, uh, sorry, real and concrete people with actual real experiences. Um, 
in many ways, I, I like to think of this as a, as a very important integration program. Um, and in many ways, as I mentioned, it also, in some cases, tested negative stereotypes. And as I mentioned before, there was a lot of media attention around not just Syrians. Uh, Haidun ended up uh, becoming, uh, you know, was in the media multiple amounts of time. Uh, and this program also was actually something that garnered quite a bit of media attention. So I'm not going to show you this little thank you video I have, not only because I can't get the sound to work, but it's also in French and the sound is horrible. But this is the last day and this was extremely touching because of course this wasn't planned. This was a, a young girl who, uh, when we finished handing out the diplomas, um, essentially said, I have something to say. This is all happening in French. And then she took out a bit of paper with French written, all mistakes and, and, and everything. And she read out a personal thank you note that she had written, uh, not just to Haidun, but to all the volunteers. And um, it was an extremely touching moment. You can't see me, I'm in there, but I'm in there crying. Uh, my face is down there, so uh, it's good you can't see me. Um, but I wasn't the only one crying. It was an extremely touching moment. And um, this is exactly why Haidun does what it does. And this is exactly uh, you know, why, what, we, what we wanted to accomplish with this program. So in general, in many ways, Haidun continued that tradition of, uh, of diaspora humanitarianism within the Armenian community. And it actually spearheaded help and, and uh, private sponsorship, particularly of Syrian refugees to Canada without any financial help, uh, completely volunteer run. And this, uh, two years before uh, the media frenzy began and before um, people really understood the extent and the gravity of the uh, conflict in Syria. So essentially by 2014, so a full year before Trudeau came to power, um, Haidun had already very quietly sponsored uh, over 700 uh, Syrian Armenian refugees to Quebec. So um, essentially, I'll end with a quote from our uh, immigration minister in Quebec. She said, uh, Kathleen Whale, and I quote, integration of Syrian refugees in Quebec are going very well, partly because of the government's partnership with community organizations that help guide the new arrivals. And so this uh, group of community organizations was essentially, began with Haidun, who at one point, by the time the federal and the provincial government got involved, was the single-handed, the organization that had um, privately sponsored and brought in the most amount of Syrian refugees. Um, this is once again before the government got involved. So in many ways, Haidun provided a model and worked in collaboration with a lot of other uh, groups who then, um, you know, once the media frenzy began, uh, worked uh, tirelessly and still continue to work in bringing over Syrian refugees. So I'd like to say thank you so much for being here this evening. Thank you to Professor Berberian once again, to the Merlouni family. And if you have any questions that you don't feel comfortable asking in person or you know, here in, in a group setting, please feel free to email me. I'd be more than happy to hear from you, answer questions, or continue the discussion. Thank you so much.